Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So right now I'm in Southern California at Hussam Istanbuli's place. He breeds some of the coolest knobtail geckos you guys have ever seen. So I'm gonna visit with him and we're gonna learn a little bit about their care, about their breeding, and just see some really cool knobtail eye candy. I'm Dave Kaufman and I am obsessed with reptiles. And I have been since I was nine years old. 25 years later, I made a trilogy of award-winning movies about them. Now my life is all about touring the world in search of them in wild places and checking out some of the most awesome breeding facilities and reptile expos while I'm at it. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. All right, so Hussam, you keep all of your knobtails in racks, which is really cool, and you work with eight out of the 12 species and subspecies of knobtails, so we can't wait to slide some of these tubs open and check these out. Why don't we start with the rough knobtailed geckos? Okay, um, so uh, Nephrus asper is uh, generally quite smaller than Amiae. Mm -hmm. uh, Amiae females tend to be around 40 to 50 uh, plus grams uh, as females. Asper will generally be around 35 to maybe 40, 45 for a big female. Um, they're uh, definitely a lot darker in color. Uh, they do have a lot of variation where they can be lighter grays, uh, but they're generally black and gray animals. Of all the species of mouth tail I keep, uh, I keep most of them the same way. Right. Um, they do vary a little bit um, as far as uh, how wet you would like their hide or enclosure to be uh, as far as the humidity, but it's fairly the same uh, amount of care right. or but, type of care. So let's talk a little bit about setup for these guys. It looks really basic and really simple. This is just what, play sand? Yes. They require a cool side and a hot side. The hot side for them is generally around 88 to 90 degrees, uh, which allows them to thermoregulate uh, when they eat and um, helps them digest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I usually provide um, just one hide on the cool side. Now, if you take a look at the cool side, it's usually always uh, moist under there. Um, the rougher species don't necessarily dig and burrow as much, so uh, they'll mostly go under here and use it to uh, help them shed as there's more moisture sure. and humidity. And then uh, during the breeding season, uh, some people prefer to use nest boxes, but I try to provide an ample amount of sand on the cool side uh, to allow the females to dig and lay. Sure. Um, so and so they're going to lay in the cool side. Correct. Um, as long as it's not too cool. Uh, I said that uh, the hot side is generally 88 to 90 degrees. Sure. The cool side is usually around uh, room temperature, um, maybe mid mid to high 70s. And so keeping them in a rack system like this is really optimal for them. Yeah, they're, um, they're not so much of display animals. They're nocturnal. Sure. If you do keep them in a display, it'll, uh, it'll be kind of difficult to see them during the day. Right. Um, a lot of people do keep them in a naturalistic setup, um, some of the European breeders. Uh, but if you have a, a bigger collection, uh, a rack system does help with uh, space. And it's also uh, pretty private for the geckos. They don't really like to be held or uh, messed with that much. So sure. it kind of gives them that privacy and safety. These tend to be a little more challenging on uh, breeding as far as geckos go. Uh, obviously with breeding any species of any reptile, you're gonna run into some challenges. Sure. Uh, a lot of the challenges that uh, I personally go through are sometimes uh, hatching eggs or getting fertile eggs. Uh, sometimes, you know, starting a season too early or too late, uh, or females not ready, you can experience some of that challenges. Uh, here in Southern California, we don't really get a uh, super cold winter, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that I do a full shutdown, as uh, ambient temperatures don't get uh, lower than maybe 65 inside. Um, so it's not really a full cool down or some of the temperatures that they would experience in the wild. So what I like, what I like to do generally is maybe more of a soft cool down, um, where I don't really bump down the temperatures uh, in the racks, but the geckos do feel a drop in the ambient temperatures in the room. Uh, I don't feed them every other day anymore, as far as the adults go. Uh, the juveniles, I do not cool down at all. I try to keep them going so they, you know, it doesn't stunt their growth or anything right. like that. Uh, but I won't feed the adults as much, um, but I do feed them maybe two to three, two times a week, three times a week, um, instead of every other day or 
sometimes every day during the breeding uh, season, uh, just to kind of keep them um, full of nutrients and uh, make sure they're getting enough calcium and uh, things like that. How long after they start pairing up do they uh, start laying eggs? So most of the species, it's pretty quick actually. Um, on the smooth stuff, you can pair uh, a female with a male a couple of times and uh, a female will become visibly gravid uh, within a couple of weeks. Generally, after a successful breeding, uh, it takes usually around 21 to 30 days for them to lay a clutch of eggs. After they lay their eggs, uh, usually, depending on the species and the temperatures, you incubate. Uh, but generally, the time uh, for an egg to hatch can be anywhere between maybe 65 days to 90 plus days. I will uh, show you uh, what's called the Amy A or Amy I, as some people sure. uh, pronounce it. This is the biggest knobtail um, in Australia. This is a juvenile, so it's not the biggest. This is a popular knobtail. Uh, I wouldn't say the most commonly kept, but one of the most commonly kept. Uh, Usually my routine is to feed them every other day and spray them every other day. Um, they don't require a bowl uh, in their a tub or enclosure as they move around a lot and they would kick sand into the water bowl. Sure. <laughs> so what I generally do is when I'm feeding and spraying, I'll spray the walls of the tub and they'll uh, go and lick it uh, to get hydrated or they'll go under their hide, uh, which is usually moist, um, and get their hydration that way. Uh, feeding is uh, every other day as well. Um, they'll get about three to four crickets depending on the sex of the animal and the size of the animal. Gotcha. So uh, generally every other day uh, is a pretty good routine to keep them nice, fat, and healthy. So this is one of your babies. Yes, this is Nephorus wheeleri wheeleri. Um, this is the nominate form. There's also Nephorus wheeleri synctus, which is more commonly kept in the hobby. These guys just tend to have a little bit more pattern, more dark. These guys don't really need a, a, a water dish as they would kick the sand into right. the water dish all the time. Uh, basic care setup is actually just to uh, give them a little spray under the hide, maybe spray the gecko just a little bit and spray the walls. So it'll make the sand nice and uh, nice and fluffy and moist for them and basically just put your hide down in here for them and they are good to go. And that's it. So the banding color of these babies is generally their adult coloration. It's not like a leopard gecko where that banding turns into you know spots and adult coloration. This guy's going to keep that coloration through adulthood, isn't he? Yeah, so generally uh, when they're born, uh, the rough species don't really change very much. Um, uh, wheeler eye, wheeler eye basically will just get bigger, their banding will stay the same. Uh, as far as synctus, the pattern won't change at all. Uh, it's only really the smooth species that start off usually a little darker, uh, depending on male or female. A uh, male will generally be a lot brighter or colorful than a female, but sure. females can do the same as well. But as far as the roughs go, uh, they don't typically change too much uh, growing. Uh, uh, as they turn into adults. This one is uh, Vertebralis, um, or a mid-lined knobtail gecko. Um, they do actually have a skinnier tail than a lot of the uh, a lot of the smoother species like Levis, but generally it is kind of an indication of how much fat storage they, they are carrying. Uh, but unlike a leopard gecko, uh, these guys, uh, or unlike other geckos that can drop their tail, these guys uh, it's very rare for these guys to drop their tail. Uh, they'd have to go through some kind of traumatic incident. Uh, so these guys do store fat in their tail. Uh, the fatter the tail generally shows like kind of the indicates kind of how healthy the animal sure. is. Uh, some species do have a different size tail, so uh, they're not going to get as fat as others. So this one is uh, Levis Levis. Oh yeah. Uh, there's actually three. Uh, subspecies or species and subspecies in this complex. So we're going to give them a little spray just to uh, kind of wake them up a little bit. A lot of times when you do spray them they'll actually drink, drink the water off their face. Right. The care for these guys is pretty similar to what I've shown before. 
uh, except these guys do actually use their hide and burrow under the sand a lot more often than the rough knobtail geckos like Asper and Amy A do. So, but the care is basically the same no matter if they're rough or smooth. Yeah, generally in captivity, uh, you can keep them all about the same. Um, some will use their hide more often than the others and uh, temperatures are generally about the same. Uh, it just depends how high or low on the rack they are. If you want them a little cooler, uh, you can put them lower or closer to the ground where it's cooler. Sure. But generally, all the care is definitely the same. All right, so you have all three subspecies of the Levis complex. Let's check those out. All right, so there are three species and subspecies in the Levis complex, uh, Levis Levis being the nominant form. Um, they all look pretty similar. Uh, they do come from different regions uh, in Australia. So this one would be Levis Levis, and these are all females. And this is the nominant form here. Yes. This is uh, Levis occidentalis. Uh, this is Levis pilbarensis. So obviously from the Pilbara region. Yes. Some keepers do have a hard time telling them apart. Sure. Uh, Levis Levis and Levis Pilbarensis being the more commonly kept species. Um, and then Levis occidentalis being a little bit uh, not as uh, commonly kept. Uh, Levis pilbarensis does have two genetic mutations, one of them being uh, a patternless mutation and one of them being uh, albinism. So we can take a look at both mutations of that. Yeah, let's do it. Compare it to what the uh, normal type looks like. Yeah, definitely. So, a patternless albino. Oh yeah. Oh. Unreal. So this is two recessive mutations, and uh, this animal is showing both of those morphs yeah. uh, visually. This would basically be a normal female uh, right here. Over here would be a patternless male, uh, not in his best coloration as it's in the daytime right now. This would be the albino female. She's also a carrier of the patternless gene, but it's recessive, um, so she'd have to be bred to a het patternless or a patternless. All right, so because morphs of knobtails are so rare, I gotta ask, how much does something like that cost? Um, it usually depends uh, if it's both patternless or uh, albino and patternless. It can go anywhere between $1,300 to $2,200. Oh, well that's actually less than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Hussam, man, thank you so much for having me out and teaching us all about these really awesome geckos. You know, these geckos have been in, you know, American and European collections for a long time, but we are constantly learning, you know, more and more about how to keep these awesome geckos in captivity. And with your knowledge, we're getting a little bit closer to, you know, having a really good understanding of how to keep these animals. So thank you so much for having me out here, man. Thank you. And uh, there's a majority of knowledge out there. Uh, I'm only one of the few keepers or uh, actually gaining popularity keepers out there. Sure. So uh, this is the way I do it. I know there's lots of ways to do it. And I, uh, other keepers and us, other keepers and I are constantly trying to learn about these species as well. Well, by keeping and doing is how we learn. All right, thank so, you very much. Awesome, man, thanks again. So there it is, Rattlers. I just wanna thank Hussam for having us out here to show us some of these really awesome knobtail geckos. And you know, part of the reptile adventures isn't just going out into the wild and seeing these, although I have seen these out in the wild in Australia. But again, part of the reptile adventure is checking out really cool private collections like this and learning how to keep these animals in our domestic situation. So I wanna thank Hussam again. I'm gonna put his contact information in the description below 
below. So you guys, if you're interested in his knobtails, you know how to get a hold of him. So guys, I want you to comment below and let me know which one of these knobtails was your favorite. Also, hit that like button, hit that share button, hit that subscribe button. When you do, hit that bell so you never miss an upload. Also, check out our Patreon. That link is below as well. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on. <laughs>